All right, well, I think we're about ready to get started. Um, one announcement is we're uh, trying to put together some activities for the teens, and we've got a first event coming up on Saturday, the 28th of August, and we've got about 20 tickets for the uh, uh, Dallas Cowboy Houston Texans football game. So they're going to meet up here about 4.30 in the afternoon for a tailgate party out in the back parking lot and then uh, have a Bible study and then go to the game. And uh, for information, contact Jeff Phipps over there, hiding behind the door. And if you have any other questions, you can uh, ask. We'll have uh, uh, various adults driving and bringing them back, that sort of thing. So that will be on Saturday, August the 28th. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So before we get started this evening, let's have a few moments of silent prayer so you can be spiritually prepared for our time to study God's Word, the util utilization of 1 John 1, 9 to make sure that we are uh, cleansed of sin, forgiven, and in fellowship, filled with the Spirit, ready to focus on the study of His Word. Uh, after a few moments of silent prayer, I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful we can be together this evening to have fellowship around the teaching of your word, to be encouraged by your word, to focus on the uh, end time events that we may have an understanding of, of where we are headed, that we may live today with a future destiny in mind. Father, we pray that we would uh, be able to focus and concentrate this evening and that we would be responsive to the teaching of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. One thing that separates Christianity from all world religions is the fact that Christianity alone emphasizes that salvation is based not on human behavior or human deeds, but on the work of Christ on the cross. Every other world religion, whether you're talking about Islam, whether you're talking about Hinduism, Buddhism, whether you're talking about any kind of New Age uh, sort of religion, whatever it is, there is a basic assumption that man can be good enough to enter into whatever the eternal state is that that uh, religious system is offering. What separates Christianity is the belief that man cannot do anything of himself that will gain the merit or favor of God, that the merit and the, the favor of God is given freely to man based on God's own love, and that, that for that reason God sent Jesus Christ as the eternal second person of the Trinity to come as the Son of God to become a human being so that he could die in our place to pay the penalty for sin so that on the basis of what Christ did on the cross alone, we could be saved. It's not based on works. Again and again in Scripture, you have passages such as Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Again and again we learn that uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So you have this, this huge difference. Christianity is distinct. Everybody wants to you know, come along and try to somehow make Christianity fit into the same framework as, as other religions, but you just can't do that. You have these statements of ex exclusivity 
again and again from the Old Testament to the New Testament that there is only one way, and that is God's way. God has revealed to man how the basic problem can be solved, and man either does it God's way or the problem's not solved. So you have this emphasis in Scripture that salvation is based on grace. Now, some people have come along and say, well, that if, if God's just going to freely give you salvation, then there's, there's no motivation to live a moral life, to live a life of righteousness, to serve God. There's, you're just freely given salvation, and so you can just go live however you wish to live a view that is referred to sometimes as antinomianism, which means that there, uh, there's no real law or absolutes. Uh, sometimes it's just referred to as licentiousness, which means just uh, taking uh, grace, uh, it, taking advantage of God's grace and not recognizing that with the free gift comes responsibility to utilize that gift. The giving and, main, and maintenance of the gift is not based on on works, but uh, the the giving of the gift and the and the retention of the gift is not based on works. So that if one is irresponsible with it, one just loses the benefit, the blessing of the gift. It's as if you were given a car. Somebody were to give you a uh, a brand new 700 series BMW, and rather than reading the owner's manual, you just uh, enjoyed the fact that you had this brand new car and you would just drive it around. You knew enough to put gasoline in it, but you didn't have any idea how to maintain it. And so when the time came to uh, have the oil changed or to take care of any of the other uh, maintenance factors, you just never did that. Eventually, the car, the engine would seize up and stop and uh, you'd be stuck somewhere, and it wouldn't be any good to you, but you would still own it, and it would still be yours. And it would be possible for you to uh, do whatever was necessary to repair it so that once again it could be usable and valuable to you. But uh, you could also, again, decide to uh, not pay attention to the rules, uh, not pay attention to the uh, uh, owner's manual to take care of it, and eventually the same thing would happen again. That would be analogous to a uh, somebody who receives the free gift of salvation, but then they refuse to learn anything about God or about uh, the spiritual life or about how to uh, live the Christian life or what the Christian life was all about. They refuse to read their Bible, study their Bible. They don't read the owner's manual. And the result is that they uh, end up once again, just coming to a screeching halt in terms of their spiritual life, they're still saved, but that spiritual life has no meaning or value to them. And that's the distinction between Christianity, biblical Christianity, and all other world religions. All world religions ultimately have man trying to gain God's approval, either through some sort of uh, social uh, work, social involvement, uh, through some sort of ritual, through some sort of personal uh, growth, uh, none of which is in and of itself necessarily bad, but it doesn't gain the approval of God. You can't win God's grace. It's not something that is earned. It is something that is freely given. And so that's the emphasis in the Scripture. But the answer to the antinomian charge, going back to uh, the early church as well as the Protestant Reformation, is that there's two aspects that have to be kept separate, but though they are related. One is uh, salvation, and the other is spiritual life or spiritual growth. And salvation is a free gift, whereas the spiritual life and spiritual growth is based on following and implementing the various uh, mandates, commandments, and prohibitions that are given uh, in God's Word. And so as we come to our close in uh, Revelation, we have to be reminded, as this section does, that these two issues are of vital importance to us. One is that salvation is a free gift. And two or three times at the end of this chapter, we are reminded that those who come 
can drink freely of the water. That is a picture of salvation. It is freely given and can be freely taken. There's no obligation. There's no works involved. But on the other hand, there is also rewards, and rewards are earned through obedience. Rewards are distributed on the basis of the individual believer's uh, personal uh, spiritual growth and the way he has handled his, uh, his spiritual life. So we have to keep these two principles in mind. On the one hand, salvation is a free gift. Man can do nothing to earn it or deserve it, but also that rewards are given and distributed through obedience. Rewards are the motivation for continuing in the spiritual Uh, spiritual life. So as we come to the conclusion of this book, we see uh, John again returning to his present time and what the message of the conclusion is addressed initially to his contemporaries, those to whom he was delivering uh, and sending the revelation, the apocalypse, the revelation given to him at the island of Patmos as it was initially distributed to the churches uh, there in Asia Minor. And then by extension or by application to uh, Christians down through the centuries since that time. And I emphasized last time that if you break down this conclusion from verse 6 to verse 21, that verses 6 through 11 emphasize the human responsibility in life. We're to give an, we are always to be ready to give an account for what we have done in this life. That's the message that Jesus is coming quickly. Jesus is coming soon, that we must be ready. Uh, The second section, verses 12 through 17, emphasizes the divine reward. Jesus says in verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So the emphasis here is on reward, not on salvation. And and if you don't keep that straight, then this chapter can be quite, quite confusing. And you can uh, re- really become uh, put yourself under a load of guilt by not understanding the thrust of this of the message. So, as we have done the last two or three times, showing the overall uh, outline of Revelation, there's the initial chapter which gives us the setting when John is has been uh, exiled by the Emperor Domitian to the Isle of, island of Patmos off the uh, what is now the Turkish coast in the uh, uh, GNC, and there he has a vision, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected, ascended uh, Lord Jesus Christ, appears to him and gives him instructions to write down the things that he has seen. The first thing he sees has to do with these seven report cards, critical evaluations of these seven different congregations, and that's covered in chapters 2 and 3. And that focuses at the end of each one of those evaluation reports on the fact that judgment and evaluation is someday coming to each believer and uh, in the church age. Then there is, as it were, a break and indicated by the new terminology that begins in chapter 4, verse 1. John says, and then I saw the things which will take place after these things, and that describes future events related to the seven-year tribulation, the messianic or millennial kingdom, and then the eternal state. Now, as I pointed out last time, and again just now, that we have to maintain this distinction between that which is earned that is rewards, and that which is a free gift. In Revelation 22, 7, we have the sixth of the seven blessing statements in the book of Revelation. And Jesus says, and behold, I am coming quickly. And we looked at that word quickly, takus, uh, the Greek word takus, which means that when these things start, they will unfold rapidly. It doesn't mean that it's coming around the corner. In fact, this word is used in the Septuagint a number of times in the same sense, that it may be a while before the beginning of the, the, the event, but once it begins, then all of the things related to it unfold in a rapid fashion. So Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who hears the words of the prophecy. So there are going to be those who hear, and I pointed out last time that this is a uh, a repetition at the end of the book of the statement at the beginning of the book, blessed is he who reads and hears and heeds. And here we have just the summation of it, blessed is he who heeds, that is the believer who applies and responds to what is taught in this book of Revelation. And if you respond in obedience, then there is a blessing 
And that word for blessing indicates that there is going to be something on the order of special privilege or special reward or uh, that somebody would be a special recipient of divine favor on the basis of doing something. And in this passage, it is on the basis of uh, responding to the message of the book of Revelation. So this refers to the present time audience. Listen and respond. Then we went ahead to Revelation 22.11, which is the end of that initial uh, initial section, which introduces the uh, aspect of individual responsibility. And this verse is where I closed last time, and it reads, Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. Now that's on the negative side. He's addressing believers. He's, unbelievers aren't here. Unbelievers were dealt with at the judgment at the end of Revelation chapter 20. The message here is to believers. And the emphasis here is on individual responsibility. And if you're going to take a certain course of action, then uh, continue in that course of action. It's up to the individual's uh, responsibility. The one who makes the decision to do wrong, continue doing wrong. The one who uh, makes a decision to be filthy, a word um, which indicates spiritual uncleanliness, uh, un, uh, 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 spiritual uncleanness. The one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And those words indicate the uh, ongoing uh, practice and obedience to God's word. It's uh, the ongoing sanctification of the believer and not positional righteousness or positional holiness. I pointed out the four key words there last time. Adikeo being the first word means simply to do wrong, to commit injustice, or to deal in unjustly with people. DK, the D-I-K, and then an ADA in the Greek, is a basic word having to do with justice or righteousness. When you put that Alpha at the beginning, that is equivalent to the English prefix UN, indicating a a negation of the concept. So, uh, dekeo would be a verb relating to the performance of righteousness, and the alpha in front of it means to do unrighteousness. Uh, Ruparos is a word that means dirty or filthy, applied in a spiritual sense to uncleanness. Uh, Dekaios and hagios, on the other hand, are words that apply to the obedient believer. Now let's look at this particular verse. Verse 11 says, Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. This is that word, adikeo. And we find it in 1 John 1, 9 and 1 John 5, 17. 1 John 1, 9 gives us the solution to any adikeo that is found in the believer's life. The solution isn't to go change your life. That's not where it starts. That may be where it ends up, but that's not how you cleanse. You don't cleanse by getting back in fellowship. The cleansing is how you get back in fellowship, and then you have to decide, well, am I going to uh, continue to sin and just be back out of fellowship and constantly go in and out, in and out like a like a ping pong ball, or am I going to learn to be obedient and not continue to just uh, practice this sin over and over and over and over again? So First John one nine gives us a solution if we confess our sins, which confession simply means to admit or acknowledge that we have done something. It doesn't mean that we. Uh, are e- emotional about it. We might be, but that's not what gives it efficacious and uh, 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 effectiveness. I often use the example of if you get a speeding ticket. Now, many of us, if we've been driving for very long, have probably had uh, our share of tickets. And some people, and I know there's a few of you who practice uh, <coughs> having a heavy foot, on the accelerator, and so you might have accumulated a number of tickets, and if you, you've done that, then you show up before the judge, and the judge is not going to ask you, uh, are you going to stop doing this? He's not going to ask you if you feel sorry about it. He just wants to know if you broke the law or not. That's what confession is. It's a legal term. Did you do it or not? It doesn't matter to the judge how you feel about it in terms of admission of guilt. 
That, com- that may affect things later on in another way, but not in terms of the strict meaning of the concept of confession. So 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That is what we just confessed. But God's grace is bigger than that, and it goes on to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just what we confessed, but the sins we forgot, the sins we didn't mention, the sins that we didn't know were sins. The slate is wiped completely clean, and at that point, then we are restored to fellowship, and we are cleansed. That spiritual filthiness has been wiped clean now. And so the believer then, if he continues to walk in obedience and application of the Word, then he stays in fellowship for a while in that status of being spiritually clean and being forgiven. First John 5.17 tells us that all unrighteousness, that is adike, the noun, all unrighteousness is sin. So it's just a synonym. Unrighteousness is just a synonym for homertia, which is the Greek word for missing the mark or falling short of the glory of God. So uh, it's a clear definition of unrighteousness there. So back to Revelation 22, we're reminded that there is this difference, this distinction between the free gift that's mentioned in Revelation 22.17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Do you want a spiritual life? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to have a relationship with God? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? Come, whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. You don't do anything for it. It is freely offered. It's accepted like any gift, Christmas present, birthday present, anything freely given, no strings attached. God doesn't put conditions on it. It is a free gift. If there were conditions, it wouldn't be free. But there's this distinction between that which is free and the reward. In the verse we're looking at in Revelation 22:12, Jesus said, "Become behold, I'm coming quickly." And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Now, salvation in the New Testament is never based on what we do. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which I mentioned earlier, Titus 3, 5, a number of other places. So this isn't talking about salvation. It's talking about something distinct, a reward. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. This is sort of like a... um, so I heard somebody once compare this to a contract in football. You get an athlete who signs up, he gets hired by a football team, and he's given an ironclad contract with incentive clauses. If he doesn't perform well, it's, he's got an ironclad contract. He can't be kicked off the team. But he has incentive clauses, so if he performs well, he's going to get additional bonuses. But the contract is secure. That's like the believer's salvation. It is secure, it's freely given, but there are incentive clauses, which are contained in these uh, overcomer promises in Revelation, these incentive clauses that focus on the rewards if we continue in terms of obedience and walking with the Lord. That's the meaning of the word misthos, which is used uh, 29 times in 28 verses in the New Testament, and it always has uh, that particular idea. In fact, what we learn when we study rewards is that reward, the use of this word is that rewards are always given, are handed out, are distributed on the basis of what someone does, and rewards are taken away for something that is not done or something wrong that is actually done. For example, in Matthew 10, 41, Jesus says that they would be, people would be rewarded for receiving a prophet in the name of a prophet. In Matthew 10, 42, he says people would be rewarded for giving water to a little one. In other words, the reward is based on a particular action. Um, Matthew 6, 2, there's a reward given uh, on the human side for doing charitable, or from God rather, for doing charitable deeds or praying if it's done but not for the sake of being seen by others. If it's done for the sake of being seen by others, then Jesus said, well, then you have your own reward just by uh, the fact that you've been noticed and recognized by other people. But then Paul states in Romans 4 4, now to him who works, that is, who does something to merit God's favor, 
the wages, that's what is earned from the work, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. So he makes it clear that there's a contrast between what is earned and what is given. What is given is grace. What is earned is work. So these are two distinct uh, concepts that uh, must be emphasized. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what is, according to what is done, whether good or bad. Now, when we look at that verse, it emphasizes the fact that for Christians, we look forward to a judgment that is referred to as the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's, it takes place after the rapture of the church, before the first scene that we saw in Revelation chapter 4, uh, where you have the 24 elders before the throne of uh, of God, and it's the seeking of someone worthy to open the scroll. It's the opening of the scroll that begins the judgment series in the um, uh, this, the seal judgments that summarize the judgments in the book of Revelation. So 2 Corinthians 5.10 is not talking about the great white throne judgment that occurs in Revelation 20, but the evaluation of believers at the end of the church age for future rewards, privileges, position, responsibilities in the coming uh, in the coming kingdom. Paul said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and let each one receive the things done in the body according to what was done, whether good, and there it talks, uses a Greek word indicating good of intrinsic value or that which is bad. As believers, we still sin. So we're going to do things that are bad. We're going to be disobedient. And we are going to be obedient in terms of walking by the Holy Spirit. That which is produced by uh, our relationship with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, abiding in Christ, that's rewardable. The other is not rewardable. And so 2 Corinthians 5.10 simply summarizes the reality of this judgment seat of Christ. It's spelled out in more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 9 and following, actually beginning in verse 10. Paul uses the illustration of being a builder, compares himself as a minister of the gospel as building something. It's built actually by the teaching of God's word, uh, which is on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins so that we are freely given salvation. That's the foundation. So in 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. And another builds on it. Others come along, teach the word, and as the individual believer responds to the word, there is a life is built from the time that you're initially saved until the time that you die or go to be with the Lord. You are constructing something with your life, and that is related to your response to doctrine. The foundation itself is a free gift. It's what you do with it that is the basis for this judgment. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, uh, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, these are the building elements. We build our lives with all of these elements. We use things that are valuable, the gold, silver, and precious stones, and we use that which has no lasting value, the wood, hay, and straw. Now, none of us can take a look at our life and discern that which has eternal value and that which has only temporal value. We can't do that. We may notice some things now and then because we have, uh, we, we're aware that we are in fellowship and we're aware that God is working through us and we're applying the word, but we don't have the omniscience that God has to be able to evaluate all the variables and all of the uh, circumstances and situations that any of us runs into. We don't know. We can't certainly tell when other people are in fellowship or out of fellowship, when they've confessed their sins or haven't. We're doing good just to make sure we're in fellowship now and then. And so we construct our lives with these various elements. Then in verse 13, 
Paul states, each one's work will become clear. One day it's going to be evident what is of value and what is not. For the day will declare it. And this terminology relates to the judgment because it will be revealed by fire. Now, this isn't the lake of fire or hell fire or anything like that. He's just using an illustration that if you've constructed something with uh, material that will have permanence and material that won't, that the way to separate the two is through a fire. And so through the use of fire, you often see metal refined and the impurities are burnt off. You see, uh, for example, in gold or silver uh, metals, the, the, as it's heated up, the impurities will burn off and you're left with the pure, pure metal. So the idea here is focusing on what survives, not on exposing the, the negatives, exposing the uh, flaws that are there. So each person's work, as it were, their life is exposed by this fire. The fire is just metaphorical here. There's a testing or evaluation of each person's work. The Greek word there indicates an evaluation. And if anyone's work which he's built on it endures, he receives a reward. So after there's this uh, removal of the wood, hay, and straw, whatever is left has eternal value, and that's the basis for the reward. Whatever was done in the power of the flesh, apart from dependence upon God, dependence upon the Holy Spirit, whatever is left is uh, is destroyed. I mean, whatever is whatever is left from that, uh, on the basis of walking by the Spirit, that's the basis for the reward. What's burned off is the wood, hay, and straw. Now, some people are going to spend a minimal amount of time. Uh, concerned about their spiritual life. They're more concerned about many other things, and they never learn anything about the spiritual life. They never learn anything about their walk with God, and they're saved, but that's it. There's no spiritual growth. As it were, they're born uh, a baby, and they never grow beyond whatever their uh, initial age is. They just stay that same infant age throughout their life that is spiritually until they go to be with the Lord. So there's no... Nothing positive that's constructed, no gold, silver, precious stones. And so the last verse applies to them. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. In other words, he won't get the rewards he could have received, the potential rewards. But he himself will be saved, yet it's through fire. This refers to the one who has absolutely nothing when all of his life is evaluated. There's no gold, silver, precious stones. It's all, as it were, destroyed, burned up. And yet he's still saved, because the salvation's the free gift. That which is done in obedience is the basis for rewards. Now, understanding that, it's a key to understanding what Jesus says in the next four or five uh, verses. In the next verse, after Revelation 22, Revelation 22, 12, Jesus states his credentials. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And in the New King James, if you're looking at a King James or New King James Bible, the word order is different. That's why I have these two different versions up here. Uh, Just the last two phrases get flip-flopped. In the um, New King James and King James, you have the phrase, the beginning and the end in the middle. In the majority of manuscripts, as well as the critical text, it's at the end. Uh, There were just a few manuscripts who had it that way, and that was what Erasmus used when he put together the first critical text in the time period of the uh, Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s. Later on, better manuscripts, more manuscripts were discovered, and the majority of them had a slightly different reading. The phrases were just flip-flopped, but the nothing is lost. It still says the same thing and has the same significance. Jesus said that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is making a statement of his deity. The phrase Alpha and Omega is used one other time in Revelation, in Revelation 1.8, where it's applied to the Father, but here it is applied to Jesus Christ, emphasizing his eternity. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last uh, letter in the Greek alphabet. So it's a more figurative way of saying the same thing that's said in the next two phrases, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is everything. God is the ultimate Uh, orientation of every human being, everything begins and ends with him. And so he states this because this affirms his own authority to bring uh, judgment.
And then the next two verses express this. Now, this is the same contrast that we found back in Revelation 21, uh, verses 7 and 8. In Revelation 21, 7 and 8, we had a positive statement made in verse 7 and a negative in verse 8. Verse 7 said, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And verse 8 said, But those who commit this host of sins that are listed there, uh, they shall have their uh, inheritance uh, burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's not talking about salvation there. It's talking about the uh, granting of rewards to one group and the destruction of of non-distributed awards to the other group. Now, this is the same thing that is meant by this in this statement. Because it comes at the end of Revelation, sometimes people have a difficult time with this, and at first blush, it looks as if this is talking about salvation. Verse 14 says, Blessed are those that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And then there's the contrast. On the other hand, there are those that are outside the gates. Of the city, but we know that not everybody's going to be in the city. When we studied the uh, New Jerusalem in Revelation twenty-one uh, five, we saw that there were the nations, the Gentiles, who were those who uh, survived, lived during the millennial period, and were given resurrection bodies at the end of the millennial period. They live outside of the New Jerusalem, and they walk in the light of it. And we're told in twenty-one twenty-four. That, uh, that the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So there are those, not all those in the new, new earth are going to live in the new Jerusalem. There are going to be many who live outside of the new Jerusalem. But some of those who live outside of the new Jerusalem are going to be those believers who did not uh, have any rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. They are not going to have the privilege of living in the new Jerusalem and having access to many of the blessings and privileges there. And that's part of what we saw when we studied Revel, uh, the, those seven letters to the seven churches and the various overcomer statements uh, at the end of each one, that those who were overcomers would have access, they would have privilege, they would have various special blessings given uh, to them and one of which would be access to the tree of life, which is in the New Jerusalem. So we have this contrast between those who are obedient, and because they're overcomers, they have the right to the tree of life. That's found back in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, a promise to, in the first letter uh, to Ephesus, that those who overcome would have uh, access to the tree of life. But those that didn't, it doesn't mean they were saved, it's just that they don't have that access and privilege to the inner areas of the uh, New Jerusalem. Now, outside the New Jerusalem are dogs. Now, that, sh- that was a pejorative term in the ancient world. They did not have dogs as pets like we do. Uh, same thing's true if you go over to Afghanistan or Iraq or many of the Middle East areas. Dogs are not kept as household pets. They are... Uh, they just run wild. They're feral, and they're used. They're scavengers, and they're the uh, take care of a lot of the garbage and uh, uh, stuff in the street. So, uh, this is a very a negative term outside of the dogs. These are those those who are, as it were, they were spiritually worthless in their lives. Outside are dogs and sorcerers. That's a term from the Greek pharmakeia, indicating those who were u- utilization of various hallucinogenic drugs in order to have a relationship with God. These were the, um, the mystics in the ancient world. The sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. In other words, self-delusion, self-deception. Now, when we look at that, uh, look at what's taught here, we're going to see some interesting things to fit with a a pattern that we've already studied many times, so this is a good summary for us. In Revelation 22, 14, as I just pointed out, those who are obedient, the overcomers, have access to the tree of life. In Revelation 2, 7, as I pointed out a minute ago, uh, the church at Ephesus was promised to the one who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
So the overcomers are going to have access to this uh, privileged inner area in the New Jerusalem, which is near the throne of God, and this is where the tree of life was located. It's described in Revelation 22, 2, and 12 in the description of the New Jerusalem. In 22.2, we read, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river, that river that flowed from the throne of God, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the health, not healing, indicating that they were uh, sick, but the word should be translated health, of the nations. Who are the nations? The Gentiles living outside of the city who come in, and so this has value for them. Now, the, those who are the... Uh, failures in the spiritual life church age don't have access. They don't come into the city, which uh, Revelation 21 12 tells us that the city had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates. Names are not on them. What are these angels? They are standing guard because they're those who are not to have access inside the city. Not that they're going to because nobody's going to have a sin nature. There's no sense of a rebellion in the new, uh, new Jerusalem or new heavens and new earth. But this is what is the circumstance at that time. Now, when we look at that, uh, at verse 15, and we see the list of uh, five or six uh, different sins there, sorcery, uh, sexual immorality, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie, um, self-deception, just another form of arrogance, this is a list that is similar to many other passages that we found in the New Testament. We've studied these a number of times, and we've studied them recently, but I want to put them all together for you because none of these lists are exclusive. None of these lists are, uh, give us all of, the, all of the sins. They just give a sampling, a representation. And when we put them all together... None of us escape in terms of committing these sins. We all do and will and will continue to commit many of these sins until the day we die. Oh, well, does that mean that we're not going to have access? There's no hope? No. That's why we have to have the grace privilege of 1 John 1, 9. It's not a license to sin, but it is a grace recovery method so that we recover from any sin that we, we commit. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 uh, gives us a similar list. Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? See, again, that's that's that group of believers that are wrongdoers and never use 1 John 1, 9, never confess their sin for cleansing. So they continue to live in a state of being unrighteous, and even if they do relatively good things and moral things, because they're doing it out of, the, out of their own power rather than dependence upon God, it has no value. And he goes on to say, don't be deceived. See, that's the same thing, same idea that we have here in verse 15. Those who love and practice a lie, those who deceive others, those who are self-deceived, uh, which is just a manifestation of our arrogance. Uh, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. See, you know, the, the Bible recognizes these are sins among other sins. They don't stand out as, as uh, uh, exceptionally bad sins. They are listed. They're just overt sins that are just as bad, just as terrible, just as evil as any mental attitude sin or emotional sin. They're not exceptional sins. Uh, Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous. Uh, there's not anybody that escapes that. In fact, Paul states in uh, Colossians 3 that all greed is idolatry. So idolatry doesn't mean that you bow down to a uh, little god made out of stone or metal or wood, but it is looking for fulfillment in life from something other than God. So neither thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5.5, 5, For this you know that no fornicator, that's an overt sin, unclean person, that's just spiritually unclean. That's not obs- observable by anybody else. That, that can be because of mental attitude sins. Some of the, um, you know, they're, it's sad to say this, but among the clergy, there are a number of pastors, and I'm sure you probably can think of one or two, 
that are, are on such a power trip. That happens in any profession. The pastor is no different from anybody else. They are on a, such a power trip and living on approbation lust that they are as much in arrogance for those sins or self-righteousness as someone who commits certain overt sins. Uh, Paul says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, see again you have this relationship between greed and idolatry, uh, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's not Inheritance isn't salvation. Inheritance has to do with rewards and position and privilege. Galatians 5.19, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, uh, idolatry, sorcery, and then we get into mental attitude sins and emotional sins, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresy, envy, and then overt sins, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I told you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Practice without confession of sin. Revelation 21, um, 6 again emphasizes the fact that, that salvation is a free gift, but rewards are based on Rewards are based on works. Revelation 21, 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. There we see overcoming as a work, resulting in inheritance blessing. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part, that is the Greek word meros, meaning their inheritance portion, in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. They forfeit rewards because they stayed out of fellowship the whole time and there was nothing rewardable. And so those lists are the same kind of lists we have in Revelation 22.15, but outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Just a reminder that there are those who, at the judgment seat of Christ, will have everything burned up, but they will suffer loss. They'll be saved, but as through fire. So, in conclusion, what we see is that, number one, the judgment of all unsaved takes place at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, verses 12 through 14. They've already been consigned to the lake of fire. The focus here, therefore, isn't about unbelievers, it's on believers. Second, this section... Uh, from starting in verse 6 to the end, is an addressing unbelievers, but it's written to challenge and to motivate believers in terms of obedience. Third, uh, we see that the issue here is rewards, something that is earned rather than salvation, which is a free gift. And so we have passages such as Revelation 2, seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It is a reward for behavior. And then fourth, as we've seen, this passage is parallel to many other passages in the New Testament which promise a loss of rewards and some form of punishment to those Christians who fail to live the Christian life where there's no production whatsoever. It's not promising judgment to those who commit those sins. Those sins were paid for at the cross. But what it's promising is that because there's no spiritual growth, there's no reward. And so they are without reward and without those uh, privileges. Now, when we look at all of this and put it into context in the Scriptures, we realize, first of all, that all sin was paid for by Christ on the cross. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 tells us that the handwriting or the certificate of debt against us, which is sin, was nailed to the cross. It is completely eradicated at the cross. Paul writes, "...and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him because he has forgiven you all trespasses when he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way by nailing it to the cross." So sin isn't the issue. Spiritual growth is the issue. No spiritual growth, no rewards. 
It's not a punishment for sin. That was taken care of at the cross. But those who are not walking by the Spirit are walking by the sin nature, and all they can produce are these sins uh, uh, that are listed in these various passages. So they're not being punished for those sins. That would be a, you know, that, that would be a double punishment. The punishment's already taken care of, but because they, they spent their life living in carnality, living on the basis of the sin nature, there's no production. So the second thing we should be reminded of here is, first, that all sin was paid for by Christ on the cross. Second, that once saved, the believer can live in spiritual uncleanness for the rest of his life. And so when he's living in a state of being out of fellowship, he's going to produce uh, various sins. There's no other option. Now, in the Old Testament, the focus was on ritual cleanliness through physical washing. But... The, that was simply to be a picture of an internal reality of being spiritually cleansed. That's why David confesses his sin to God. He is ritually cleansed through the rituals at the temple, but he is spiritually cleansed only when he confesses his sin to God in Psalm, uh, Psalm 51. So there's always been this emphasis on cleansing, as a, a cleansing sin after salvation. Third point is the overcomer, then, is the believer who's growing spiritually, confessing sin. Maybe I should put that in the other order. He's confessing his sin. He's growing spiritually. He's claiming promises and trusting God, and he's learning and applying the Word. Whenever he fails, he confesses sin and can move forward. Now, we all go through stages and times when we're confessing, we're out of fellowship, we're in fellowship, we're out of fellowship, but over the course of our lives, there's production, and that's the basis for rewards. Uh, fourth point, overcomers receive various rewards and privileges in the eternal state, which are denied those who have no production. 1 Corinthians three fifteen. Now, that brings us to the closing of Revelation. In verse 16, we have Jesus' statement of his identity and of his authority. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you, meaning John. He sent his angel back in the first chapter, who would be the guide and the one who would take John through the various visions and scenes in the book of Revelation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to, tes to testify to you these things in the churches. This is the first mention of the word church since the end of Revelation 3. Why? Church is raptured at the end of Revelation 3. The church isn't present during the tribulation. First mention of the church. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Now there's an allusion to the church as the bride of Christ that returns with Christ in Revelation 19, but this is the first use of the word church since Revelation 3. Then Jesus identifies himself in Old Testament terminology. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Isaiah 11.1 1 introduces this terminology for the Messiah. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, looking at uh, the lineage of Jesse, the father of David, as a tree. And it's been cut off, but then out of this stump comes a branch. There comes forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And, it, and then in uh, Isaiah 11.10 goes on to say, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, that is to Israel, for the Gentiles shall seek him. That is foreshadows uh, both, I think, the church age as well as uh, the millennial kingdom. The Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. That's the glory of the messianic kingdom. Isaiah 9, 7 talks about this, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So this is the focal point of uh, these two these phrases, the root uh, of Jesse, that um, when Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David, he is identifying himself with the Old Testament uh, prophecy of the Messiah. And then the phrase, the bright and morning star, is 
uh, related to Jesus as the one who is the true light, who has come into the world. This is found in John chapter 1, verse 9. He's the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And he is, in terms of the Old Testament passage, Malachi 4.2, the son of righteousness who will arise with healing in his wings. And then, starting in verse 18, he comes to give a, the conclusion to the book. He says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. As we come to the end, wait a minute, I get ahead of 17 there. Yeah, I got ahead of 17. As we come to the end, there's a reiteration again of the freeness of salvation and of the importance of obedience for rewards. Verse 17 emphasizes the freeness of salvation. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. It's the free offer of salvation to anyone. And let him who thirsts come. Anyone who desires salvation come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. In Christianity, salvation is free. You don't do anything for it. You just accept it as a free gift. However, if you reject that gift, there are consequences. That's what follows in verses 18 and 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, which focus on judgment. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. There is clear truth and revelation in, in this book. And if we add to it, and make things up, add to this, then there is judgment. The plagues that are written in this book relates to eternal uh, condemnation. Verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. This is talking about the unbeliever who uh, rejects the uh, book of prophecy is true, that as a result of this, they will have also rejected the gospel, and they are, do not have a, their name in the, uh, in the book of life, and they are, uh, have eternal condemnation. Verse 20 then set, concludes, He who testifies to these things is Jesus Christ. He says, Surely I am coming quickly. This is now the third time we've heard this in this chapter, a reminder that he is coming uh, quickly and that this is sure and certain. And the response is, Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the attitude of the believer. We should be looking forward to his coming at any moment. We're not looking for the Antichrist, the tribulation, Armageddon. We're looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the final statement in the book reiterates a theme that goes from Genesis to Revelation, the grace of God, that we are saved only by grace, not by works. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is a common closing comment you find in the early church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So after, what, six years, we have reached the end of our study. But you only think that. Next week we're going to come back for our final flyover. You know, when you finish, you have to go back and have a good summary and conclusion. And after all of the uh, time that we have spent in Revelation, we're going to take one more time to come back and start in chapter 1 and go through, hit the high points again in terms of that, but also to summarize the basic uh, message, the basic themes that we've seen in our study of Revelation, and that will conclude our study of Revelation after 240 hours. So some of you have done a great job of hanging in here. You have a question? <laughs> Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to have gone through this book, to study these things, to be challenged by the truths that are here Father, as uh, Scripture closes out by saying, even so come Lord Jesus, that is our, our hope, our anticipation as we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ for us in the clouds at the rapture. Now, Father, we pray that we would be responsive to the challenge of this book. In Christ's name, amen.